Good day and welcome to episode 5 of the Rider Saddle. We are in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan and have just wrapped up volunteering at the finish of this year's Silk Road Mountain Race. And while we were there, I managed to squeeze in a little interview with none other than Sofian Sahili. He's a French ultra endurance cyclist and third time winner of the Silk Road Mountain Race, has some incredible stories and insights to share in this interview and I uh, can't wait to share it with you. So let's dive in, shall we? Enjoy. All right, so Sofian, so good to be here with you uh, at the end point of the 2023 Silk Road Mountain Race in Chapanata. You've had a hell of a ride uh, behind you. Six days, 16 hours and 48 uh, minutes, I think, if I'm correct. I believe that's right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a hell of a record. Um, you look fresh for uh, <laughs> I'm having... I'm not, but... Yeah, you had only four hours of sleep, I believe, in all that time. Uh, no, probably more. Okay. Probably more. Oof, wow. Well, I'm flabbergasted by the achievement. Anyway, it's uh, something I really would like to get into, but I'm going to reserve it for later in the interview. First of all, I would like to take it way back, like in all the other interviews, uh, delve into your life a little bit so that people can get to know your background and how you got this far into the uh, ultra endurance cycling career. So why don't you introduce yourself to the people who don't know you yet? Well, my name is Sofiane Seyli. I am 41 years old. I live in Paris, France, and I am what you may call a professional bike packer that um, just races pretty much all over the world, trying to target the most pre prestigious and hardest uh, ultra cycling races. And I also, besides that, do a lot of just solo bikepacking and a uh, couple bikepacking with my girlfriend. Yeah. But yeah, I'm basically just the guy that rides his bike a lot. Okay. And if I can take it back to your upbringing in France, uh, you grew up in Paris, I believe? I grew up in the, in the, in the suburb of Paris, yeah. in a rather poor What was that like for you growing up there as a kid and practicing sports, uh, maybe already cycling? Yeah, not really. I, was, I would like ride a bike like every kid, but not more and certainly not competitively. It was, it was a rather happy childhood. Big, um, lots of uh, lots of cousins, mostly girls, but still lots of cousins. Um, tough neighborhood, yeah. But my mother was very uh, strict and determined to make sure that I would not fall under the influence of the wrong persons in the neighborhood. So it was always, you know, make your make sure that your homework is done, get good grades go to bed early and uh, so yeah she raised me to yeah strive to uh, be someone that is uh, that is honest and uh, hard-working I don't know uh, to, to what extent that worked yeah or honest certainly <laughs> hard-working we'll see about that did you uh, rebel against this kind of upbringing I, can imagine I did yeah I was a, a pretty rebellious uh, teenager actually yeah. I mean I was a good kid when I was uh, when I was less than uh, what 13, 14 years old, I was I was a good kid. I was obedient. I was I didn't like school, but I was good at it. You know, I was top of my class and stuff like that. So uh, in my neighborhood, a lot of kids would actually drift away and uh, start you know dealing dealing drugs and stuff like that. I was I was never. I was always serious, but then, yeah, as a teenager, I would rebel, but not to the extent that I would commit crimes or whatever. Yeah. I was just a, yeah, a rebellious uh, teenager, like most teenager, teenagers, I guess, you know, listening to metal and um, just uh, not really, I, I just wanted to question everything. I, would, I was not really willing to take anything for granted, but I think it... The roots of this go actually further back than just uh, just my my teenage years. I think even even as a kid, even as a good kid, I was always curious to know why things should be the way they are, 
And then as a teenager, I was like, yeah, well, why? There's no reason, there's no actual reason. Maybe they could be different, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I still, um, I still was, I think my, my, my upbringing make, made me uh, a little bit scared of what would happen to me if I, would, if I was not uh, doing my due diligence in school. So okay. even though I was, uh, I was rebelling, I was not uh, missing, skipping school and stuff like that. I was still... Uh, yeah, smart about responsibility was, when it comes to Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's trying to explore different ways of thinking and trying just to, just to question authority. Why do people have it? Why do, why do other people have to uh, submit to that authority and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. And what about school then? Did you like, believe in being in school? And did you graduate successfully? Did you go into a study uh, after high school? I never really liked school. I thought it was pretty unfair that we would first of all have to go to school. I was not really willing to go to school. I'd rather I would rather be doing, you know, stuff that I wanted to do like watch cartoons and playing with my friends. Yeah. But I think the most unfair thing for me was like having to do homework. It's like you go to school all day and then you're home. You think you have some free time, but mm -hmm. no, you still have to work. Yeah. So, I thought that was pretty unfair. Um then as as a high schooler, yeah, I was I, I basically I had it. I was smart enough to just get just graduate without working too much, and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, but yeah, I would say starting sixteen, maybe seventeen years old. I was kind of like, okay, I can, I can see the path that most people are taking and I'm not sure it's some, something that is for me. I'm not, I don't know what is for me, but just the, the traditional path of, you know, graduating and then uh, going to college and then getting a job and then uh, getting married and then uh, buying a house and then having kids and you know, all that stuff. I was like, not very appealing to me, actually. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure I want it. I, st I kept, you know, trying to figure something out. I went to, I went to college, studied uh, literature. Um, then I studied um, uh, languages, linguistics. Uh, and, the, and the end goal was to get a degree that would uh, allow me to teach French uh, overseas. Um, and so already, I had kind of this idea and this desire to get away from wherever I was, wherever I'd been raised. And yeah, that degree seemed like a, a, a key that would kind of open up many doors. And I would be like, where do I want to live? I want to live in Korea. I can teach French there. I want to live in Brazil. I can teach French there, whatever. Yeah. And then life happened and I ended up working in a working in a magazine and uh, I was kind of, I had the degree, if I wanted to use it, I could, was not willing to do it uh, right at that moment. But yeah, I was, still, I was still kind of trying to figure out what my life would be like. Yeah. Yeah. This is all pre-2010? Uh, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah between sort of say 1995 and 2020 yeah i would say that i i graduated from high school in uh, 1999 and then uh, i spent a long time in college because i loved it i didn't yeah. love the actual studying but i love just i mean i was studying like right in the center of paris yeah and i could meet people from all over the world and i would just explore all uh, many school of thoughts you know about because i i mean that that rebellious uh teenager that i had been turned into kind of a rebellious young man mm. and just being surrounded by like-minded people and trying to yeah just think about what what was possible in this world that seemed uh very pretty unfair 
and yeah, not especially on the right track, but I mean, you know, going to demonstration and uh, spending afternoons talking politics in cafes and stuff like that. So uh, obviously partying at night, yeah. drinking, <laughs> drinking beer and wine. Pretty much, yeah, the, the, the typical, the typical uh, years of uh, a, a college student in humanities in, uh, in Paris. Yeah. I love it. I find it interesting because in a way, I, I find it relatable. Um, I'm, I just turned 30 and I've had these 10 wild years of bike travel and bikepacking and eventually making it somewhat of a job and making it really official during these 10 years. But I often look back at my sort of uh, 12, 13, 14 years old to the period of maybe being 21, 22, so almost 10 years of being a little bit lost, being very experimental, super rebellious, not liking my home country and wanting to get away from it all, uh, while being in the school system and sort of figuring life out on the right track, as many people would call it. And I'm just interested in uh, one particular aspect of this, um, this period of, of your life, and it's the same for me. The bike was always part of all these messy years that I had before I sort of found the track that I liked and a passion that I wanted to pursue. Was it the same for you? Did you always use the bike in Paris? To cycle always around? had a bike. Yeah, commuting. always. Yeah, just commuting. Always had a bike. It just seemed fun and uh, convenient and fast. Yeah. You know, to. I mean, I, I would not always go to college with my bike, but sometimes I would. And, it would just depend if I had a bike at that time. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, living in Paris, sometimes you have a bike and then it gets stolen and then you're like, yeah. oh yeah, I need to get a new bike. But no, I've, I, I'd always been, you know, riding bikes. Never, yeah. it, was, it was never like, a, during these years, I can say it was a big part of my life, but whenever I didn't have a bike, I felt like something was missing. I was like, oh, yeah. and I get to, you know, to get on the Metro again, maybe, yeah. Uh, would be everything would just be con more convenient and faster with a bike yeah. yeah so when when was it that the the spark happened the spark of of bike travel in 2010 you you started with it i suppose maybe a year before or two years before you sort of figured out that you could use the bike for for more than just commuting basically when i started working it was 2006 uh i found a job in a in a, in a magazine and um, commuting by bike really made sense because it was only six or seven K from my, from my house. Then they moved their offices uh, on the other side of Paris. And then I had to go from uh, cycling 12 K a day to 32 K a day. And while it seems like not much to the man that I am today, it's actually a serious commute on a bike. Yeah. Yeah. Five days a week. That's yeah, a, it's five days a week. A lot yeah, of kilometers. It, that's, that amounts to, yeah, more um, close to 10,000 kilometers a year. Yeah. And then, yeah, I decided to buy a better bike, spend a little bit more money, because I, I figured, well, if I'm going to use it more, I need uh, just better stuff. Um, and then I, uh, I, I had kind of a hiatus where I stopped working for, for a few months or a year, something like that. And I moved and I was living in Lyon at that time. And uh, the, 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 the idea of riding a bike to get nowhere or just to loop around my house never really occurred to me in Paris because that would be silly. Yeah. <laughs> but in Lyon, the, where I was in the city, in 5K I was in the countryside. And then I realized, oh, I can just like go on a nice bike ride and you all be out of the city, which is always pleasant. And, and I kind of started liking, you know, riding bike, not to go places, but just for the purpose of riding bikes. And, um, but it never materialized in, in something, you know, particularly long or, or really well organized. It's just like, there was one weekend that I did a rather long, we did, bikepacking didn't exist at that time. I had a backpack and I was on my bicycle and 
like cheap bicycle from uh, Decathlon. And, uh, but I still I rode like 300k in two days. Yeah. I, I got home and I was like, <laughs> destroyed, <laughs> completely destroyed. I was like, this is insane what I just did. Why not just 50? What did you feel? Because I was I was on a vacation uh, in the south of France, near uh, Avignon. Yeah. And I was like, why not go home my bike? Why not? Because I had started, you know, riding 50, 80, maybe 100k. Yeah. And I was like, it seemed like a challenge, a crazy challenge, of riding 300k in two days. And then I it, I kind of forgot about that whole stuff, and I went traveling a couple years later. Went to Southeast Asia, which had always been a dream of mine, for an unknown reason. I have always wanted to go to Southeast Asia. Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, whatever. This was my dream land, whatever. And I uh, finally booked a ticket, strapped on a backpack, went there. And people were asking me, because people knew that I had cycled a little bit. It was like, oh, you're going to ride your bike there. I was like, I don't want to leave Paris with a bicycle to get there, to fly there, and then be stuck with a bicycle. And then if I don't like it, I'm just stuck, you know? Yeah. So I'm like, I'm just going to go there. And if I feel like cycling, I'll, I'll rent a bike or I'll buy a bike. And it's exactly what happened. I went there, backpacked for seven, ten days. And after that, I was like, yeah, was like, hmm. who am I kidding? <laughs> Just trains, buses, tuk-tuks, taxis, scooters, whatever. At some point, I was tired of not being independent. Just having to rely on schedules and, and just having to bargain with the drivers. And like, this is no fun. And I, uh, I bought a second-hand bike in, uh, in a town in Laos called Luang Nam Tha. And I never pounded with it. I just rode 7,000k with it in a, through uh, Southeast Asia in, on the course of uh, five months. Wow. Yeah. How was your setup? Like, uh, you said bikepacking didn't exist at this point. Early 2010s, I believe this yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, there's no specific bags. I guess there were panniers, like, that they had been around for many years. Did you put some racks on your bike, some panniers, and just, like, stashed a bunch of stuff in it? I, I put a rack on, the, on that mountain bike. 26 inch and I still have my backpack which was actually not mine I had borrowed it because I was not willing to buy a, a, a you know nice trekking backpack for for, for this and a, a friend of mine that uh, very nicely offered to to lend me one yeah but I since it was not mine I couldn't really abandon it somewhere <laughs> so I decided to strap it to that to that rack and there was my setup Wow. A very light setup already. I yeah. mean, I, I never, ever traveled heavy. Always traveled light from the very beginning. Yeah. Because the uh, thing is, I, was, I knew I was going to have to carry that backpack for a few months. So I put very few things in there. And then I was like, all right, just strap it to that, to that rack and there we go. Yeah, and Southeast Asia lends itself particularly well to eating out and also staying in... in, uh, in Hostels, hotels, and guest houses because it's fairly cheap. Yeah, so it's is, is, is very cheap, and you can you can have a full meal for one or two euros. You can find a hotel for five euros. For five euros, you won't you won't get the best hotel, yeah. but you can find you can sleep indoors. And then, and then if you if you're willing to spend turn fifteen, you'll you'll have something like really clean and AC and stuff like that. So yeah. it's it's not a big budget to to eat out and stay in hotels every day in Southeast Asia. And route-wise, did you follow a particular route? Did you buy a book, a map or something? Or did you just go with your gut and... I had the Lonely Planet, like pretty much everyone that goes to, that goes backpacking in, uh, in Southeast Asia. And then I was like, all right, what can I check out? And after a while, I figured, not, uh, not that long actually, but after maybe a week or two, I figured, figured out that I was not really interested about the sites, about the, about the temples, about the museums, about whatever. That the real, the part that I really enjoyed was just the, the cycling. And then I was like, okay, I'm just gonna cycle. And if I miss, well, there's stuff that I really wanted to see still, like Angkor Wat, 
and some uh, some places in the, in uh, Myanmar, mm -hmm. like in the lake and stuff like that. But the whole point of every day was just the, the, the journey from point A to point B. Yeah. And you did this five month journey uh, all alone, I assume? By myself, yeah. 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 When you came back to France? My girlfriend had left me, yes. Uh, <laughs> so did you have to deal with any other opinions than that of your girlfriend? Uh, family, friends, hey, what are you doing, Sofian? Why, why did you go to Asia and now you're back, so you're going to go back into your job, right? Yeah, that's pretty much what my mother thought. <laughs> my mother was like, well, I guess that now that uh, you you did it, you can you know, live li a, a, a normal life. Yeah. And I was like, mm, I think that's that's going to be my life now. Now that I have discovered bike touring, I don't think I can live without it. I don't think I can, because it was just the conjunction of the two things that I love the most, which is traveling and cycling. Yeah. And I was like, I, uh, I know deep down that I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life. And I don't know how it's going to happen. Maybe it will be on and off, but the bike touring is not going to stop. Yeah. And I was already planning on, on going back, you know, I had, I had, uh, I really wanted to, to be home because, uh, five months away is a, is a long time and, uh, five months with my, my family, my friends. So, uh, and especially, you know, going home for the summer when, uh, everything's happening and it's just nice to be in Paris. But then I knew that as, as soon as winter would come, I would leave again. Yeah. Yeah. And the next five years, I think this pattern sort of fulfilled itself because between 2010 and 2016, those were really your prime touring years before eventually finding racing. Which uh, continents did you, did you cycle on? I went back to Southeast Asia the next year because I had loved it so much. And there are parts that I was really willing to visit, uh, especially Indonesia. And I had heard a lot about the island of Sulawesi. Mm -hmm. uh, so I w really wanted to go there and I went there. I was not disappointed at all. It was absolutely magnificent. Um, and then I really wanted to go to Iran. So after cycling a little bit in, uh, well, not that, no, I was cycling a lot in Southeast Asia. I, uh, I flew to Tehran and I cycled from Tehran to Istanbul. Um, then I did a bunch, bunch of uh, shorter bike trips in Europe. Um, that's also one of the time when I became a bike messenger. So touring would be more like, oh, okay, I have three weeks vacation or four weeks vacation. I'm going to go there and there. You know, the, the days of leaving for three or four months were, were over for actually for just a, a, a few years, but still they were over. Yeah. But I, I would keep on just bike touring as much as I could. I mean, it's hard juggling financial stability yeah, with bike travel. Those two things usually stand apart. They don't often coincide. Yeah. So your bike messaging job sort of uh, gave enough funds to then travel for a couple of weeks or months. Yeah, yeah. Bike, I was, I was I, at, that, at that point in my life, I was, I was just like uh, any, any worker where you, you, you work full time and then when you have your paid vacation, you go on a vacation, but just, it's just that mine was, was by touring. Yeah. And um, then I, I felt the urge of going on um, really long bike tours again, after uh, I would say maybe two years of being, you know, standing, of standing still somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I decided to quit my job as a bike messenger and I went to New Zealand. Okay. And then I traveled uh, to New Zealand, Australia, and went back to Southeast Asia. Cause yeah, that really pulls again. you back. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I absolutely love that part of the world. I love it. It's just like, it's, everything's so easy. It's, everything is easy. People are nice, people are friendly, people are uh, respectful uh, and, and the food is good. Uh, things 
kind of work, you know. They're not, it's not Europe. They don't work like in Europe, but they, you know, they kind of work. And when they don't work, nobody stresses out, you know. Yeah. It's well. like, I remember being on a, on a boat in Myanmar that was going down the Irrawaddy River, which is the main river in Myanmar. And the boat uh, got stuck in a sandbank. And then he tried to get out of the sandbank and, uh, and pretty much ruined the, the engine. And then for a few days, it was just uh, kind of like slowly cruising down the Irrawaddy River. And the trip that was supposed to take a couple days went on for four or five days. And nobody would care. Like the, the Europeans on the boat, I think it was five of us, we were like talking about what did we think is going to happen. Like, I don't know, we've been here for already twice the time that we were supposed to, to, to spend on that boat. I don't know what's going to happen. I think the, the, the engines are dead. And I think they're really, really, really scared of, of navigating at night because of, you know, they re, they're in the risk of getting stuck into another sandbank. So this is why we're not actually traveling at night at all. But yeah, you could feel that there was that nothing was happening on the boat. Nobody was getting impatient. People were like, "Yeah, well, that we're gonna get there someday." Yeah, we don't know when, but we're not gonna die on this boat. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that. I like. I mean, I'm not a very patient person as uh, someone who grew up in Paris, but. Being surrounded by so many people that are actually very calm and are actually not getting impatient about things not going their way, it makes you patient. It, 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 I mean, it gives you perspective. You're like, why would I be the only one that would be pissed off about what's happening? Yeah. Actually, you know what? They're right. They're right. We're not going to die on this boat. It's a, a flexible attitude. Yeah, and I, I like that about South Asia. Yeah. I guess that uh, that is something you you took home and maybe made your own. S yeah, I don't know. Somewhat, I, I become I became more patient. But the thing about Paris is, uh, it's it's <laughs> it makes you aggressive. Makes me aggressive. I'll yeah. be honest. It makes me very aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> I do not like the person that I am when I'm in Paris. I'm just like yeah, very impatient, stressed out, too many people, too many things happening at the same time. I need to be there and then an hour later I need to be there, have no time to waste. So yeah, if I get stuck behind someone I'm like what's up? Why why am I stuck here? Yeah. I mean, I don't mind losing three days on a boat in Myanmar, but I don't want to lose three minutes standing in a line in Paris. So it, it's it's just like why I want to leave that city. A couple of other bike tourists told uh, Veren and me this uh, sort of analogy between uh, countries like Southeast Asia the, and also Central Asia, that people here have time and there's a flexible attitude, flexible schedules, things happen in a different time frame. And that between Europe and maybe the States and, and countries like these, there's a fundamental difference in why, for example, hospitality is so good here. Because people have time and you sort of, when you come by, you can fit into their day. Whereas yeah. in, in Europe, there's schedules. And Not gonna as a bike traveler passing by someone, you don't really fit into someone else's life at that moment because they have a schedule for that day. It, so, is, it is sometimes puzzling. Right. I was in Kazakhstan before this race and I went to town and I was looking for a hotel and a girl was walking down the street and I stopped her and I asked her if there was a hotel. She was going in the opposite direction, right? <laughs> asked her if there was a hotel and she was like, I'll take you there. It was a 15 minutes walk. And then she stayed there for another 15 minutes to make sure that I would get into my room and kind of doing the translation. I was like, you were going somewhere and now you will be at least 45 minutes to late to where you were going what is yeah what is the schedule yeah. <laughs> i don't understand but certainly if i'm walking down the street and somebody wants to go to a hotel i don't really see a scenario where i have an hour that i'm going to spend just taking care of that person yeah but yeah awesome great it's yeah. just like it's puzzling but great so um i want to get started with the uh, the race stories here um, you 
I think uh, you started the first race ever in 2016, Tour Divide in yes. the States. Was this the first edition of the Tour Divide? No, no, no. Uh, the first edition of Tour Divide, I think, was 2008. Okay. Oh, yeah. so it's an old one. It's very I old. I didn't one. know that. Yeah. So, what attracted you to the Tour Divide of 2016? Why did you want to race? So, what happened is I toured the that route, that route the route of the of the Tour Divide originally um, has been created by uh, an association called Adventure Cycling America. Been put together piece by piece by uh, a bunch of people. Uh, and then the story is that in 2008, few crazy riders were like, what if we race it? What if we leave at the same time, all of us from that, the beginning of that itinerary and see who gets to the end of that itinerary first. And that was not the first ever bikepacking race because that concept had been you know, created a little bit earlier on a on a on an itinerary called the Grand Loop, but it was one of definitely one of the first bike pack races ever. And I uh, actually toured that route, and while I was touring that route, I heard about that race and was like, "How can people race here?" It seemed crazy. It seemed crazy, and at that time I was. I was a bike messenger. I was really fit. I was really fast. I was one of the one of the best messengers in Paris, one of the fastest, and I was having such a hard time on that route. And and when I heard that it would take the fastest guys a couple of weeks to finish it, I was like it's it's impossible. They're not human. These are legit superhumans. And it was mind-boggling, mind-boggling and also humbling, you know, because you think you're strong. Mm -hmm. And then you, you hear about people that do stuff that are twice as hard as what you do and they do it twice as fast. And it, I, have, I have a rather big ego, I'm not going to lie. And so I was riding that route, riding, riding. And then I was always, I kept thinking about these races, kept thinking about them. Who are these guys? It was a question that would pop into my mind several times a day. Who are these guys? Because it's not guys that I knew, you know. It's not like I would watch the Tour de France and I would, I would know the, the guys that, that, that raced that. But these were anonymous amateurs. And still they were doing something that seemed for me much, much more impressive than riding the Tour de France. And every time I would, I, would, I would meet someone on the course that I knew was, you know, involved in, in the, that, that race, I would ask so many questions about, you know, who, who are they, what, what are they like, and it's like became sort of an obsession, and, and to the point that I was like, they, they have to be human, and I am human too, and if we are human, then we're capable of doing that same thing, and... And I don't want to believe that I'm not capable of doing what they're capable of. And I was riding, riding, riding every day, getting better, getting, you know, uh, up to that challenge, mentally stronger, uh, uh, better bike handling. And towards the end of the, the, my tour, I was like, okay, I think I got a hang of this. I want to know if I got a hang of it enough that I actually can come there, race, and be successful. Okay, so you, you ended up doing the race. Yeah. Um, you got to third place, yeah. I believe, which for your first race, that's incredible that you, I mean, you were already used to cycling long distances from your touring uh, years, but then you applied this to the race, you got third place, and that must have felt grand, first of all, that you got a podium spot on your first ever race. Uh, I'm pretty sure it, it sort of propelled you into your, your other races because it must have given you lots of confidence that you, you got third place in this race. What was your approach like regarding bike and packing? Do you mean for Tour Divide? Yeah. 
I was a complete rookie and I didn't do any research because I thought I knew it because I had been on the course before. And what I didn't realize is that I had been on the course in August and this was June. And for me, like growing, growing up in Paris, I was like, yeah, June is summer, you know? Yeah. But June in the Rockies is not summer. <laughs> and I went without proper rain gear, proper cold weather gear. And I didn't really bring the right bike. I had a cross bike with skinny tires, 40, 40 Cs. I, I pretty much thought that what I, I just needed to do, what I had done touring was just faster. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not math, it's bike riding, it's yeah. ultra cycling, and yeah. it's, it's, it's math doesn't work. Yeah. And I suffered a lot. I, I did, I think I did, I wonder if I did all the mistakes, but I did a lot of mistakes. Like I went with new shoes, super stiff, new shoes, carbon sole, destroyed my feet in the first three days. Uh, yeah, definitely not. Not the right bike, not, no proper gear. Uh, I, I lost my, um, my ability to, to charge after uh, uh, probably, I don't know, 1,000 or, uh, or 1,500K. And then I lost my, my light. And yeah, a lot, a lot of stuff happened that uh, made me really, oh yeah, I lost my, uh, I had my phone, but my, my memory card failed, so I had no music anymore. Oh. So yeah, many, many things happened that made the, the ride a very hard one, very bumpy one. And I'm a, I'm, for some stuff, I'm a fast learner, but for other stuff, I'm just a slow learner. And I just need to make, to make the mistakes to learn from them. And it's a long process, but you know, at some, at some point it will pay off. Yeah, I mean, if I can compare this for myself for a second, just coming off of this 2023 Silkroad London race. It was my first ever race. Uh, I lasted five days and discovered I'm definitely not a racer at heart because I didn't enjoy the speed very much. Um, it was painful on my body and I'm pretty sure I made a bunch of mistakes regarding bike and setup, although I, I do have quite a bit of bike picking experience. But for you, this was, uh, this was not a reason to stop. You got third place in that race, then you did a bunch of other races uh, in the following years. Uh, I don't know if, this, if you saw it straight away as something you could make your career. Was it something that you said, okay, this, I love this, I know I can make this work, I'm gonna go do this professionally, or did you just go again between the stability of being a bike messenger, doing races, and then sort of let that process grow until you could make it something professional. I never really thought that I would be able to make a career out of it and uh, earn money from this. It pretty much just happened and I was really surprised when it happened. So the approach that I had is just that I raced Tour de Vaud, finished third, suffered a lot. I was like, okay, I know I made so many mistakes if I fix all the mistakes that I did, if I come with a, a, a proper bike, like a mountain bike, if I come with the right shoes, if I, if, if I make sure that my, my, my lights don't fail, my charging doesn't fail, if I make sure that, yeah, I, I, I have like proper uh, uh, guiding with a couple of GPS in, in, in the instance of one uh, actually fails, it's like, okay, I know, I, I know, I felt like I, I pretty much hit all the pitfalls and I was like, okay, now we know how to avoid them. Yeah. But I had suffered so much that I was like, I can't, I'm not ready to do it again next year. It's just too hard. So I picked a different race that seemed easier, which is the Trans Am bike race, which runs from uh, uh, Astoria, Oregon, all the way to Yorkton, Virginia, 7,000 K. And it's actually definitely easier. But it's also maybe much more boring. It's more roads, I guess, no? It's just road. It's ah, just 100% right. tarmac. Okay. And this is why I picked it. I was like, well, that Tour Divide was very, very hard because it was off-road. So Trans Am is going to be easy because it's going to be on-road. And it was, it was not wrong. I was not wrong. Trans Am is much easier than, than, than Tour Divide. Um, but I had, I had a bit of a bad luck 
I slashed the tire and uh, at the moment where I slashed the tires I was already out of tubes and so I lost uh, I lost quite a bit of time like 24 hours yeah. fixing that mechanical and then I went from uh, third position to I don't even know how far I was and it pretty much ruined my race and then it was mentally really hard to get back and I ended up finishing in uh, eighth position something like that and it kind of made me uh, very bitter because I felt like, well, the, the, the sport that, that I thought was so awesome, actually, you can pretty much race once a year. And if you have some bad luck, then it's over. And your next, your next chance is the year after that. Yeah. And it felt really unfair and just too risky and... I was like, okay, I'll, I'll see if I'll, if I'll race again or not. And then the next, uh, the next year, I was, was the year that I was supposed to go back to Tour Divide, and I was not really motivated after what had happened on on Trans Am. Uh, but I got invited to a race in uh, Taiwan, biking on Taiwan, and I figured, yeah, well, why not? Uh, it's true. It's true that it's true that racing is is sometimes sometimes fun. So I could go, and it's just it's just a thousand k. So it's it's going to be pretty straightforward. And mm -hmm. and I had I had been to Taiwan before, and I loved the island. So I was like, yeah, I know it's going to be it's going to be scenic, and there's not going to be many cars. So I'm going to have a good time. And I went there. Started really fast. Overheated. Uh, Dehydrated, cramped up, got sick, spent 12 hours in a bed trying to get better. And then uh, I restarted after that, that first 24 hours. And I was, I think I was second to last. And then for me, it was the, the thing that was just about finishing, finishing the race. Yeah. And then I started, it was really slow because I was so depleted. And then I, I managed to eat more get more uh, uh, minerals into my system and then at some point I started feeling good you know my legs came back and then I was like wow okay I feel great now and I started pushing hard on the pedals catching people left and right and then I got caught up in that whole what I call the Pac-Man mm. and I started catching 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 people all the way to third place and even though my ambition when I had come to Taiwan was to finish first. I had a really good time just playing Pac-Man and going from second to last to third. And and also the dot watchers had a lot of fun watching this race and it's yeah. it's, it's it's something that that is that is important for me as well. Yeah. People that watch your dot on the map, seeing you progress along the line of the route. I I do these races first and foremost for me, but it would be hypocrite to pretend that I do not care about the fact that people are watching and that people are entertained by what I do and that people send their love and support and somehow make me feel important. And I think that anyone that pretends that it's something that they do not care about at all is probably lying <laughs> because it is, it is, yeah, it is, it is a great feeling to have like hundreds or even sometimes thousands of people that are cheering for you. It is. Yeah. And it's not the first reason why we do it, but it's certainly something that is very nice. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's how I got back in the game. I was like, it's pretty. It's actually pretty cool to race, okay. and um, and then nine, 2019 came, and I had I had made enough mistakes on races to finally get my shit together and start winning races. And then the pandemic arrived. And then the <laughs> pandemic arrived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I I've seen in your in your record, uh, your racing record, uh, actually in a in a sort of weird angle to the pandemic. 2020 was like the biggest year for you, if I may say so. You did yeah. five races, yeah. 
you got second in three of them, and then you won two of them. Yeah. Uh, that's massive. And even doing just like th three races like these in a year is already quite big. So you did five. Uh, first of all, how did you pull that off in the pandemic time? Was it di more difficult or was it actually on the contrary, like easier to be alone and to just focus on the race and be out in nature? And secondly, what did that year do for your career? So 2020 is the, the year that I won the Atlas Mountain Race. I had, the, the year prior, I had won the Attila Divide and the Inca Divide. So I started to make a name in that, in that uh, community of, of bikepacking and ultra cycling. But at last mountain race was a huge blast. It happened in February where nothing was happening in the world of cycling. Uh, it had great coverage. Uh, uh, from Nelson and, and the photographers, which at that time were uh, Nils Langner and um, Leanne van Leeuwen. And um, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, maybe. Leanne van Leeuwen, yeah. Van Leeuwen, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you would know better than I. Than I. Uh, and yeah, great coverage. And um, <laughs> what I did is I basically raced that whole race without sleep. I just took a few a few naps over the course of four days and people were like, what is happening? They were watching the race. It was like, this guy is never stopping. Absolutely never stopping. He's just, he just keeps on riding and there is like no moments of rest in that whole four days, 1200 K and, and, yeah, they, they, they could not believe what, what, what was happening. And they, it blew up, you know, and then like media, and like media, like cyclists or, uh, or um, whatever, like the general ride, ride CC or bike CC, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a big, big on these websites, but they, the, yeah, they all talked about the race. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, I, I, I became uh, like the new wunderkind of, uh, of uh, bikepacking and ultra cycling. Yeah. And, and then it was a matter of like, all right, I think I, I know how to beat everyone now. <laughs> yeah. Because I just, I just need to go and never sleep. <laughs> and I was really eager to actually uh, see, go and beat everyone and win every race. <laughs> And this is why I signed up for so many races because I was like, yeah, I'm I'm the best now. I'm yeah. just like I, I I know how to do it. Figure I know the it trick. Out. Secret recipe. Yeah, I know the trick. And uh, and then I went. Uh, then it was locked down. And then the first race that uh, that happened after lockdown, I was like, I'm in. I don't even care what it is. I don't even care what it is. I don't even care if I have the right bike. I'm in. And it was the Hope 1000. And I didn't really have the right bike. In, uh, in Switzerland. In Switzerland, yeah. And I, uh, I actually finished second behind Jochen Beringer, who, uh, who managed to sleep very little and also just ride faster. Yeah. And I was like, okay, huh. Maybe I haven't figured this thing out completely, but I was still... Then I, I came into this kind of cycle where... If I win, I'm like, oh, really cool. I love winning. I want to I want to win again. And if I finish second or third or whatever, I'm like, huh, that was not cool. I need to I need to wash this off with a win. And I, that's how that that cycle started. And this is why I actually raced so much that year trying to trying to win everything and winning two out of five. Yeah. Did that uh, drain you in any way? Uh, I guess the lack of sleep in these races can wear you down quite a bit. It didn't really drain me, no. I uh, I I think I I probably raced too much in the in the summer because mm -hmm. I did the Hope 1000, uh, and then I did the Three Peaks bike race, and then I did the the French Divide. So that's 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 a lot of racing over in the course of a few months. Yeah. But I enjoyed it. Honestly, I, I I'm not gonna lie, I enjoyed it. And yeah, I mean you you go sleep place for a few days but then it just takes it just takes another few days to to recover and then you can go at it again so yeah the um the the pandemic time uh, 2020 we noticed at Belen and I that the bikepacking industry sort of flipped on its head uh, things went crazy 
so many sales and companies started investing in events and uh, hiring ambassadors, etc. Uh, it was a great time to be in the bikepicking space and I imagine that that also applied for ultra endurance, uh, that suddenly there was more financial and also ambassador opportunities uh, with companies within the, within the bikepicking space. Did it help uh, that you were in this position, you know, going for first place in races, uh, getting there twice in that year? Did it land you any specific deals? Uh, did you sort of start figuring out the commercial side of it? Or was that earlier than 2020 already? It was definitely 2020. Yeah. It was the conjunction of, you know, that, that great uh, period of economic growth for the cycling industry and my victory at, Aslan, at Last Mountain Race and subsequent uh, uh, successes in, in races. So that's when I started uh, working with many of my sponsors. Mm -hmm. um, at first it was just a, a, a product-based sponsorship, but the fact that I kept on racing and delivering and finishing systematically on the podium, then it just laid ground for what would happen uh, in 2021 where people that I've been working with were like, it's really great working with you and we want to move forward and instead of just giving you product, we want to actually help you financially and help you get to the races and reward you for the wins and stuff like that. And so that's, yeah, that's definitely uh, the, the conjunction of, of that growth and my, the beginning of being very successful in backpacking that led to 2021 being the first year where I could actually didn't have to work as a messenger to, yeah. to support my life. Yeah. yeah. How, how did that feel that moment? You must have felt very proud of yourself and also maybe people like your mother, your family. Oh, my mother. Around you. Oh, finally. You must have been ecstatic yeah. about this change. Yeah, yeah. It was great for my mother because my, my, my mother, is, it's, it's all about, are you getting paid, you know? Yeah, what are you doing, Sophia? <laughs> if, it's, if, it's, if, it's a, if it's a passion, I'm not interested. If it's a job, all right, you have a, you have a job. Yeah. That's, a good, that's a good point. <laughs> you know, yeah. That's a yeah, good yeah. starting point. So, yeah, no, my mother was pretty thrilled that what was just a, a hobby turned into a job and that it was not jobless anymore. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, no, for me, it was, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. I was like, I am paid to ride my bike wherever I want in the world. This is now my job is just to do what I love the most. It's just like pick somewhere that I want to go yeah. and just either race or tour there. And yeah, that's the only thing that is expected for me. And then I get paid for this. It was unbe unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, it's also not that easy because I imagine people listening, viewing, you know, if you, if you hear this, it may sound like that is an easy thing to do to achieve something like this. I mean, I'm not a racer, so I know for a fact that cycling just in touring pace can already be quite difficult with the challenges you encounter out in nature. I can only imagine just from five days on Silk Road what it must feel like to have this First of all, the body sort of degrade, the sleep degrade. Um, you put in such immense physical effort over the course of a race that that must have an effect on you some way, physically or mentally, but also there is pressure because you were having this success because of wins. And somewhere in your mind, you must think, if I don't win, then this might go away. Do you have that at all? This like struggle with pressure on having to win or on having to perform at a top level uh, consecutively for s every single race you go into? I struggle, but it's not a pressure that I feel for my sponsor. I mean, the pressure might be here, I don't even know. I just struggle because I, I put the pressure myself and I also feel pressure from just, just my followers, my fans. Yeah, that want to see me win. Yeah, because people expect and it. Uh, people expect that I'm going to win. Yeah, and I have a, I have a, a kind of, kind of a, a 
tricky approach to this that is probably not justified, but again, we are human beings, so we're not always rational. But I'm always afraid that if I start a race and I, and I go hard and as best as I can and I don't succeed and I don't win, I'm always afraid that people will be like, huh, maybe he's not that strong or maybe he used to be stronger or maybe he was just lucky these other times or, you know, that people will actually start doubting and, be, and will start being less interested and that just, yeah, my, my credibility will be lessened. And so whenever it's the, it's the start of a race, I'm, uh, I'm a nervous wreck because I feel like I put so much on the line. I feel like I'm, by, I'm pretty much with every race putting all my career on the line and that not winning, not being the best, and I know it's not, I know it's not going to happen. I mean, if I think about it rationally, I know that you cannot take away 10 victories on ultra races from just one loss. And it's not even a loss if you're second or if you're third. It's just you were still second best, third best. You're still on the podium. It's not a, like a terrible result. And I know when, you, when I think, but I, I still do feel I'm still like, I still, I'm still scared, like really not rationally scared that people were like, yeah, I mean, I knew it was not that strong actually. <laughs> so compared to this, the pressure of the sponsor is nothing. Yeah. It's absolutely nothing. Do you feel like your age adds pressure? Not really, no. You think 41 doesn't matter? I think you're pretty strong at 41. Yeah. I don't, I don't fear people because they're 26 or 30, <laughs> 34 or, I think it's bike, it's bike packing. Yeah. Bike packing is, a lot of bike packing is here. A lot of bike packing is about, you know, what you went through in life and how it makes you, it made you mentally resilient and you're much more resilient when you're 40 than when you're 25 or 30. For sure. Because you, you've been through much more. So I'm like, Maybe I don't recover as well as a kid, you know? If someone is 25, he, he can ride 1,000K without sleep and then sleep four hours and feel fresher than me the next day. But when you need, when you need, to, when you need to really push yeah. against something that is really hard, against, you know, that, that headwind of that sleet or that snow, or when you, need, when you need to absolutely not stop, even though you're wrecked, yeah, when you're 25, uh, well, good luck. I'm not saying it's possible. I'm just saying that uh, for me, it's it's much easier to uh, to do now than it was 10 years ago. Hmm. Yeah. It's the essence of experience, I guess. And I mean, it counted also here. Um, you have just raked in or raked in your third win yeah. on the Silk Road Mountain Race. I want to talk about that. Uh, maybe we can just bundle the. 2021, 22, and 23 Silk Road Mountain races into one nutshell of a story. Uh, first of all, I think it's fascinating that you can win something like the Silk Road Mountain race three times in a row. That in itself is very unique, uh, together with the circumstances that Kyrgyzstan throws at you. Uh, I mean, for those who've never been to Kyrgyzstan, it's probably a bit of a mystery and maybe sometimes it looks even easy, you know, there's dot watching, seeing the red line <laughs> and not knowing the profile, <laughs> the headwinds, the rivers, the food, you know, all the things that are thrown at you here. Um, but also the fact that you do these immense distances under such pressure and consecutively three years in a row, I find it commendable. And I just want to say that, that I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, can you, give a synopsis of what, first of all, attracts you to Silk Road Mountain Race, what you've learned from these three editions, what are your main takeaways and sort of lessons, and also what did you enjoy about it and why did you keep on coming back, eventually getting your third win here? What, attract, what first attracted me here is the difficulty. Um, 
seeing, I mean, dot watching the race, seeing how slow it was, watching the watching the pictures, the movies with the insane hiker bikes, the crazy altitude, foul weather. I know it doesn't sound fun, but the the way that I progressed in my career, starting with Tour de Vine and then, and then doing gradually doing harder and harder stuff, you strive for the pinnacle of the sport at some point. You let you kind of look at the races and you're like, all right, what is the hardest thing out there? And it seemed to me that the Silk Road would be the one with the, the most challenges because very remote, very few people on the course, which means few resupply, uh, bad roads, long hiker bikes, just, uh, yeah. Crazy altitude. Crazy altitude. The weather can be minus 10 to plus 40. Just pretty much everything. All the challenges that you can find in bikepacking, they're all here. It seemed like the, the ultimate puzzle to, to solve where you, anything goes wrong in your, and it's, it's pretty much over for you. Not, talking, not even talking about you know, food poisoning and stuff like that, which is very common here. Yeah. I was like, I want to tame this beast. And this is why I came here. And for me, it was much more about you know, the challenge first. And I, re I remember in 2021 coming here and touring a little bit before just to get acclimatized both jet lag altitude and touring here and be like this is much more than a challenge it's, it's beautiful here i'm gonna have the time of my life riding here it's just it's just amazing and and even though i had a hard race with i had i had to overcome uh, a lot of obstacles i st i still was blown away by the the beauty and the majesty of the landscape here. And this is why I decided that I would, that I would come back, both because I enjoyed it so much and then also because having, having struggled with, with mechanicals and having uh, probably not chosen the right bike, I figured I loved it and I'm gonna love it even more. If I have like, you know, sus suspension and the right tires and I don't struggle so much with punctures and broken wheel, and um, and that's what happened. I came back in 2022. Again, had such a good time. I think it was even better because that time I had the opportunity to have m uh, many more interactions with the locals, uh, sharing uh, peaches and tea with a few young men in the mosque, sharing a, a breakfast uh, with the shepherd and his family, sharing dinner with a, a young boy and, and his family as well. Uh, and and it, it was it was it was a race, but it was also an, uh, a, a proper proper travel, proper adventure, where you you I was lucky enough that for sometimes for an hour or two, I would just forget that I was in a competition, and I would be like just sharing stuff with people, um, and I loved it so much that during the race, I decided that I would come back the next year. Because I, my, the way that I thought about it was like, okay, what are the chances that next year in August there is a place in the world where I'd rather be than Kyrgyzstan Circle of Mountain Race? And I was like, the chances is at best very slim and realistically non-existent. So I decided, you know what, I'll come back because I love it. I just like... The remoteness, like the fact that there these these places are not only stunningly beautiful, but you have them to yourself. There's only just a few, a handful of people in these like crazy valleys that are a hundred kilometer long, just a handful of people, and you're. It's just like it's all this beauty to yourself. I mean, I love solitude. I love being alone, and here, it's so easy to be alone. So it's just it's just a mix of. The beauty, the solitude, and then just the, the it's so, so exotic, so exotic. You, you're you riding your bike and then the shepherd's waves and and he's like, yeah, chai, chai. And you, and you get into his yurt and you have tea. Like he lives in a yurt. He lives in an actual yurt, you know? 
Yeah, I mean, we have yurts in Europe, but it's, it's just for show, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's just like, here it's, it's an actual living place, yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah. And you're like, wow, okay, it's, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere else. I'm so far away from my daily life. And that's what I want. This year, the uh, podium was a hard place to get to. Um, you had probably more competition than ever. Who were your biggest well, foes? Well, you had you had James, who'd, who'd been there uh, two times before. You had Jakub, yeah. who'd won the race in 2019. Uh, Justinus, who had just finished uh, second on Tour de Vard. You had uh, Jochen Beringer, who had, who had uh, finished ahead of me on the Hope uh, 1000 in 2020. Yeah. You had uh, Josh Ebert, who is the transcontinental winner. Um, you had uh, Seb Boyer, who is a uh, Badland winner. You had uh, Angus Young, who is the Holland 12 550 winner. Yeah. You had basically uh, 10 people that had won ultra cycling races, which is I've, has never been seen before at the start of, a, of an event yeah so yeah it was it was hard it, it went extremely fast because the density was crazy and we were just all willing to battle and go as hard and fast as possible to reach that finish line first and what I what I told you about how I feel prior to the race uh, and you know that pressure and that uncertainty where I'm like can I pull it off I look at these 10 guys I'm like any of these guys can win can I pull it off why would it be me instead of the other 10 why me yeah so many doubts and then during the race as soon as it starts, I'm like, I don't, I don't know that I'm gonna win. I'm not certain. I have no certainty that I'm gonna win, but I am convinced that I'm gonna win. Like deep inside, I'm like, I don't really imagine that anyone else but me can win. And I am also convinced that Nobody else wants it as bad as I want it. And even now that the race is over, I, I, it's not something that I can know, but I'm pretty sure that nobody out there wanted it as bad as I wanted it, because I wanted it so bad. I was thinking about winning every day, all the time. That was the only idea that was in my head. It was like winning, winning, winning. And sometimes I would just like lay down for a nap, you know, and I was completely exhausted and my, my brain and my body probably needed eight to 10 hours of sleep. And after an hour, an hour and a half, I would wake up and I would be like, oh no, I wanna stay. I wanna just not keep lying down. And then I would say, but what you'd rather do, keep lying down or win? And then I would instantly, instantly just get up and be like, yeah, the mission here. There was only one mission, there is no, there is no alternative. Sometimes I would, I would be riding and we're like, okay, so what happens if you actually finish second and third? I was like, I don't know. I can't actually think about that. I refuse to think about that. I refuse to envision a scenario where I come second. Like, what's, the, what's the point? Because it's not going to happen. Yeah. I'm well, not going to let it happen. There was so much load also on the fact that this would be a, a triple crown, I think you call yeah. it. The three wins on the Silk Road Nanta race. Uh, I guess it's what contributed to the spectacular time. Six days, 16 hours, 48 minutes. Um, what was the longest uh, amount of time you spent riding between naps? Was that longer than 24 hours? Well, I, st I started the race. So the race started at nine. Yeah, you had uh, a fall. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't stop the first night. Um, then I kept riding through the day and I just probably stopped around 2 a.m. Yeah. So that's around 40 hours, a little bit more than 40 hours for the first stint. And then a nap. 
And keep yeah, I couldn't really sleep. Yeah. I went into my into my sleeping bag and slept in my mattress. Went to my sleeping bag, stayed there, and um, wasn't really able to sleep for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah. And yeah, I stayed there for three hours, just resting. I think it's my brain rested a little bit. My legs rested. Yeah. But. Yeah, I was in a semi-conscious state for at least two hours, and maybe then I grabbed an hour of sleep. So I really struggled to sleep during this race. Because mm-hmm. um, then the, that, the night after that, I was at CP2 at Kelsu, and again, couldn't sleep. Uh, so I stayed there for all two, hour, two, maybe two and a half hours, and then decided, what's the point of being in that yard if I can't sleep? So I, uh, I uh, went back, uh, back on the road, rode a little bit, and then I spotted... Uh, a little hut, abandoned hut, and I tried to get some more sleep there. Probably got actually better sleep there than yeah. in the yurt, but again, not great. And then I went to, to Baitov. I was in the hotel and I was hoping that I would get that really good shut eye where you go to bed, lie down, 30 seconds later, you're just completely passed out, and then four hours later, you wake up. But it didn't happen. I got I got somewhat good sleep there, but not that that really really resting deep sleep that I was hoping for. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just like this. I maybe the fact that that I had no phone and that I wasn't sure when I was gonna wake up. Yeah. Then my brain would not actually get into that that True. mode that is like oh, I'll pass out the. The phone is gonna take care of the rest. The alarm is gonna. The brain, the brain was like, "Can I really just pass out now?" Probably not. I need yeah. to check, check the, check the time. Yeah. Now and then. Yeah. Um, I think to round up, uh, you've built something incredible. You've done three wins on the on three Silk Road Mountain races. I think you're the only one who has the three wins on. Three separate because there's only been five editions. I so. think there's, I mean, the only one that has three wins and three on the same backpacking race. Three consecutive, yeah. yeah. Um, one last question before we round this up. What is your plan? What uh, What does the, the near future hold? Are you going to keep on racing? Do you think you'll retire sometime? Uh, what's going on in your head regarding uh, continuing this thing? Every year is my last year. Every year I tell, I tell people it's my last year because I can't really see the challenge. But every time I find a new challenge, so I don't know. It's, it's, it's really hard to predict because the way that bikepacking is evolving, you get new races every year. Mm-hmm. And some of them are pretty exciting. Like I did the Bright Midnight this year, which is a first edition race in Norway, which is actually organized by Justina, so finished third here. And the, the whole concept is that uh, it doesn't get dark because it's summer in Norway. Yeah, midnight so the sun. sun ne- yeah, midnight sun, sun never set. And, and I was like, wow, okay, that's a novelty, exciting. And so I, did, I decided to go. And so even, even if I decide to retire and then some really exciting race appears, I can't really guarantee that I'm not gonna come out of retirement and be like, this is this is too good for me to pass the opportunity. Yeah. So I don't know. There's there's still stuff that I want to, stuff that I want to do. Uh, I'd love to um, give it give a go at the Arizona Trail Race. Um, I, earlier this year I was on the Holland Trail 550, but I was not fit because I couldn't train because of a dog bite that I sustained in Greece. So I'd love to actually go back to the Holland Trail with proper training and. Uh, and see if I can uh, win this one. Mm-hmm. So that would pro- that would probably be my uh, my two main goals for next year, and then, and then just a matter of I don't know. There's one thing that I would really love to do would be to race as a pair with my girlfriend, who's a really really good racer. Uh, she pretty much always uh, finishes first female in her in her races, mm-hmm. um, and I'd love to. Yeah, it would be really really fun to try and, uh, and race together so that's something like if she finally accepts i'll be really happy to do that kind of stuff yeah and oh i God. like this community i really like this community I like uh i have many friends here now so i don't want to 
kind of like go away. I want to hang hang around. And if I look at what what JP does, for example, now that he's uh, no offense, but probably past his prime, is like yeah, still finding ways to do stuff and uh, you know mentoring that uh, Jacob Hora. They raced as a pair here last year. I could definitely see myself come back to Silk Road Mountain Race as a pair. Yeah. Find a new challenge. I don't think I'll come back to Silk Road Mountain Race to race it, to win it, mm -hmm. and like be like, oh yeah, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> <laughs> it's a point. It's okay, it's okay. It's, uh, I've proven enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'll see. I like riding my bike. Yeah. So I'll keep on riding my bike. That's for sure. Nice. I love that. Uh, I want to thank you for for this interview. It's been fantastic getting to know you more. Um, already known you for a couple of years and just fascinated by everything you do next so thank you for sitting down with me i'm gonna keep an eye on, on my your pleasure tristan my pleasure it's really. gonna be nice to see you at more events in the future and yeah. um yeah i hope this interview helps some people get on their bike and challenge challenge yeah. themselves into Why not? these kind of races and crazy things yeah. uh, on and off the bike yeah so thank you no worries pleasure cheers cheers Ah, wonderful. That's great. Hey, you're a good speaker. <laughs> yeah. Good client. In, in French, we say he's a good client. <laughs> bon client. Yeah, bon client. Bon client.